Let me start this video off by saying that I liked Across the Spider-Verse. I thought it was a very good movie that I waited for patiently for years and felt mostly content with the contents of. People who like something are allowed to criticize it. Now, I also want to state my affection for Ben Riley. I think the Clone Saga was a very convoluted storyline that went on for far too long. But Ben as a character worked very well for being a throwback to an earlier, less committed Spider-Man. And I've never felt he has been used to his potential, both in comics and other forms of media. I'd even go as far as to say he's probably my favorite Marvel character introduced in the last 30 years. So when I found out he was going to be in Across the Spider-Verse, I was very excited. Now, I had low expectations as far as I didn't think he would be a main character or have the most lines among the new characters. But I thought there was a lot of potential in having at least a version of Ben who could perhaps resonate with Miles as someone who has similarly taken the reins from Peter as the new Spider-Man. What we got instead was interesting. The first scene of Ben in the movie is him being called over by Spider-Woman and telling her that he cannot talk right now and is thinking about his past as he leaning against the wall, shortly thereafter letting out a moan and describing it as a particularly harrowing memory. He later assists in trying to catch Miles to no avail and is easily defeated by Spider-Gwen's trap toward the film's end. So here's the thing. I'm perfectly fine with him not being in the film that much and even failing to get Miles as I understand that's necessary to advancing the plot. What I, and I think many of his fans, don't like is turning the character into a parody when you don't have to. As I stated earlier, we could have had a small scene of Ben telling Miles in a failed bit to get him to not try preventing his dad's death that he knows what it's like to take over after Peter and that none of them sought this fate but they tried to make the best of it. He could even call himself a dollar store Peter if you want some self-deprecation. But to have a happy-go-lucky character from the 90s be characterized as this extremely depressed, guilt-ridden caricature rubs some people the wrong way, and this has played a role in why Ben Riley has been trending on Twitter for the last few days. Now, as I said earlier, I like the movie. This one, in my view, legitimate criticism of it does not stop me from still liking it. The problem with fans of superhero content, especially in the digital age, is they treat any criticism of what they like as a personal attack, even if you still like the same thing they do and just not a particular part of it, and refuse to see the points of the other side. So instead of fans of the movie admitting that maybe they could have handled Ben in a different manner that was more heartfelt and uplifting, even if you still wanted it to be comedic, we have multiple fans shown in screenshots here claiming that Ben has very few fans and citing this as a reason to not care or take our perspective seriously. This is already bad enough, but then we have a particularly egregious comment from Channel Pup. Now, before I respond, I need to say this. I like Channel Pup. He did a Spider-Man film retrospective that I thought was enjoyable. His tweet reads, not even a hot take. Ben Riley was always stupid. The changes made to him in the film were appropriate. Now, many of the responses point to a belief that I have, which is that Channel Pup has never read a single comic with Ben in his entire life. If I were to denounce, for example, Miles Morales as always stupid, I would point to issues featuring him that I have read and explain my belief that the character, or at least the comic version of him, was a derivative version of Peter made by writers who believe the only legitimacy a black superhero could ever have is through inheriting the mantle of a white one. I could also complain about how making the Green Goblin his arch enemy was redundant after the latter had been Peter's, and that the placement of Miles in the 616 universe after the Ultimate Universe collapsed was a bad decision. I could speak on these things because I read them. Since Channel Pup seemingly does not read comics, which is the main form of media that Ben has been featured in prior to this film, the character holds no reverence to him, and he is thus unaffected by its lousy portrayal of him. And really, the disconnect between Ben fans and people who don't read comics but like The Cross the Spider-Verse goes back further than this. I've never understood how someone can be into superheroes and completely ignore the medium for which they originated, and I've 
seen my position straw manned time and time again. I don't know where to start, even though I can begin on issue one. Comics are too expensive, even though you can read thousands of them online for free, etc. So I just got to a point where I accepted that people don't read comics, and I've mostly been okay with that fact, but there's every now and again an occasion where that disconnect surfaces to the forefront. Just for example, I was very excited when Alfred Molina was confirmed to be reprising his role as Doc Ock in No Way Home. One, because Doc Ock is one of my favorite Spider-Man villains, and the Alfred Molina version in Spider-Man 2 is one of my favorite film villains, period. My friend who doesn't read comics responded to the news by speaking disparagingly of Doc Ock, saying that all he can do is throw his tentacles. I was extremely annoyed by this. Not to give a full recap, but Doc Ock was the first villain to defeat Spider-Man, which almost made him quit being a superhero. He founded the Sinister Six, indirectly killed George Stacy, almost beat Black Cat to death, almost married Aunt May, and stole Peter's body. Then I remembered that he hasn't seen Spider-Man 2 nor watched any of the cartoons featuring Doc Ock since he was a kid and never read any of the comics, so it makes sense that he cares very little for the character, and now I'm seeing this again with those that are fine with Ben's portrayal in Spider-Verse 2. I've also met people in real life who didn't know Miles existed until the first Spider-Verse came out, which was seven years into the character's existence, which I remember very well because I used to read Ultimate Spider-Man when I was a kid and was very devastated by the death of the uh, Earth's 1610 Peter. So the picture I'm painting here is one where you have people who have a Sacred Cow comic adaptation, which in this case is Spider-Verse 2, and you have some people like myself who are dissatisfied with the part of the movie while still liking it overall, and these same people who have the Sacred Cow comic adaptation cannot exercise any humility or understanding of why comic fans may see a fault in the adaptation, so they respond by attacking or belittling the source material even though they have no credibility in their arguments because they've either never read or have read very little of it. Across the Spider-Verse's version of Ben Riley was lousy, so much so that I hope he's just a cameo in the sequel, and it's okay if you like it, but the people telling fans of the character to get over it or speaking disparagingly of Ben are a bunch of ignorant, shoe-shining backbenchers who can't even read a book with pictures, let alone form a coherent argument to defend that garbage adaptation.